prior to uh, the IPM program, we were spraying twice a week, every week, the entire, basically the entire farm. Now we're spraying once a week, but only a small, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the farm once a week versus the whole thing every week. You know, the grower doesn't want to use chemicals. He really doesn't, but, you know, they have to, and if they only have to use them once as opposed to three or four times, then, you know, that's all the better. Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is the process of planning and taking steps that will prevent or control pests. Pests, of course, are those harmful or troublesome organisms that, left unchecked, can devastate both crops and bank books. Traditionally, growers have relied on one main control method, chemical control, to keep pest populations in check. Many farmers today are switching to IPM programs because they offer the pest control they are looking for while at the same time allowing them to reduce the use of expensive pesticides. IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, is a process of planning and uh, controlling or managing pests. It involves various different techniques in doing that, whether they be cultural, biological, or chemical, and in a method so that it's environmentally sound, but also has um, some economic benefits to the grower. You need to know about diseases, you need to know about insects, you need to know about weeds, and you have to have a, a fairly good understanding of the science behind it. You need to know the techniques that are involved in, in, in all those various different uh, disciplines. But you also have to have an understanding that IPM is about people, and that it involves a, a whole team of, of people. It involves the grower, it involves the scout, the consultant, the researcher, the extension, and with that team, you're able to make some informed decisions in order to implement an IPM program in, on your farm. This video introduces you to the five components of IPM. Identification, monitoring, thresholds, methods of control, and evaluation. It will explain these steps using examples currently in practice on Ontario farms. As you will see, IPM is very much a management approach to pest control. You make your pest control decisions based on the knowledge that you have about your own farm and the information that you collect during the season. The first step in the IPM process is identification. You need to identify the pest and the beneficial organisms in order to find out about their biology, life cycle, preferred habitat, and other characteristics. Experienced scouts are also an asset. Using this information, you can find out what stage and time is the best to control the pest. The second step in a successful IPM program is monitoring. Monitoring is the regular inspection and sampling you do to get an estimate of the size, extent, and location of pest populations. It provides you with the information you need to make your decisions. It's important to sample correctly and at the right time. The information collected helps you decide whether you need to take action or not. It's best that the same person does the monitoring throughout the season. You can do the monitoring yourself, however many growers today hire scouts to monitor their fields and orchards for them. Chris Thomas of Chatham, Ontario has been a professional scout for over 10 years. Her client base has grown steadily over the years, made up of growers who have learned to trust her judgment. You know, going back about 10 years I heard about Chris and uh, I thought it was quite a something we needed in our operation uh, and uh, as, as we got larger uh, it became a bit more difficult to uh, to scout everything so I guess uh, we look at it today that it's a it's an insurance ourself to ha looking over the field myself for her to come in either before or after me and we can talk about the problem um, she's uh, been been a, I don't know what we do without it now. Communication is like 95% of, of the, the whole thing is, is that you have to have a good relationship with the grower. You do have to build that trust. Um, you know, I give them a report. Um, I don't just hand it off and put it in their mailbox or something. If there's a problem, I'll give them a call, talk to them about it. We'll, we'll do some, you know, problem solving and, 
and uh, you know, the, we'll talk back and forth. A, a lot of the times, I learn. I learn from the grower. They don't just learn from me. I learn from them as well. They know their land best. They know what problems they have. They know um, spots in their field where they've had problems before. So it's it's a real cooperative effort, and that's that is crucial in uh, consulting for somebody and being a scout. Yeah. I think what you have to do is have. Uh, trust in, in, in the two, in the, between the two of you so that when she leaves the field you trust that what she says she, she meant and that you do what she did because if you're going to just contradict the, doing it I, don't, I think there's where the loss of money is. The, the cost of monitoring uh, for some growers who haven't done it before they seem to think it's a lot of money but for seven or eight hundred dollars to do a site on my farm I've got 100 acres and I feel that's effective for that 100 acres because if I get a hot spot from the scout, I'll go check a couple other places that I know I have a little bit of trouble and it gives me a heads up. So seven or eight hundred dollars for a season, I can't go through my orchard and spray water on for less than two thousand dollars if you figure my time, my equipment and my fuel. So seven hundred dollars is nothing. Whoever does the monitoring, you need to record the date, the pest species present, the location in the crop, the number of pests per sample, the stage of development of the pest and the crop, the crop variety or cultivar, and weather data. You can use weather data such as temperature, rainfall, humidity, and leaf wetness to predict the development of some pests. A well-planned monitoring procedure is the backbone of a successful IPM program. The third step in the IPM process is to follow the thresholds or guidelines established through research for individual pests. Thresholds help you decide whether pest controls are necessary and if necessary when to begin the controls. Well when you use the term threshold that's a level to which of, of a pest that the tree can manage itself. So for instance in mid-August you would say for a mites 10 active mites per leaf seems high for some people but that is counting nymphs and adults your tree can probably manage that because it's coming towards the end of the season and they can take that. Anything below that threshold, you don't need to spray. Anything above that, you should be spraying. Your goal as a grower is to keep the pest under control at critical times so that it does not cause unacceptable loss. Usually some damage is tolerable. It's up to you, the grower, to decide when it is time to start controls. You need to watch for the threshold limit by regular monitoring of your crops for pests and damage. You want a no surprises growing season when it comes to pests. The fourth step is choosing the methods of control. Growers who have adopted an IPM program use a variety of control methods and they have a number of options open to them besides just the chemical option. It really is a combination of approaches that works in the battle against pests. Consider all the controls available to you, physical, cultural, biological, genetic, and chemical. Physical controls involve setting up physical barriers like screens to keep pests away. It can also be the physical removal of the pest or its habitat. Cultural methods are the practices you use for good land management. Crop rotation is an approach that involves alternating crops to meet specific objectives such as reduced pest habitat, soil improvement, and reduced pest food sources. Biological control methods use a pest's natural enemies to keep pest numbers below treatment thresholds. You can encourage these natural enemies by selecting pesticides that are not harmful to them and by providing food and shelter for them. The other way is to release them into your crop. Predator or parasites are now widely available for use in greenhouse vegetable crops. Rob Hansen of Leamington, Ontario takes advantage of the physical, biological, and cultural controls available to him in his greenhouse operation. He has sealed his greenhouse with screening material to physically prevent new pests from coming in from the outside. He takes advantage of biological controls by releasing beneficial insects into his greenhouse, and these beneficial insects feed on the pests that feed on his chrysanthemums. He can even control diseases by employing cultural controls, especially when it comes to the manipulation of the greenhouse environment. Well, for, from a disease point of view, we're always manipulating the greenhouse environment f from a standpoint of humidity control so we don't get into certain um, diseases. We're venting and heating strategically in order to keep the humidity levels at a point where, where those diseases aren't, aren't able to, uh, to flourish. All of this has allowed Hansen to significantly reduce the amount of pesticide he needs to spray. 
So those dollars saved in pesticide use and, and time, the cost of labor to apply the pesticides, I would say definitely more than, uh, more than pay for the, the biocontrol um, organisms that we're releasing into the greenhouse and the, and the management time that it takes to, to oversee that. Genetic control methods include choosing a cultivar or variety based on its genetic characteristics. Today, plant breeders are not only selecting individual plants with desirable characteristics, such as disease resistance, they are also able to incorporate genes from other species. These are called genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. Examples include corn hybrids that contain a protein of the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. This protein will control a specific group of insects, and this lessens the pest damage. However, non-BT crops must be planted with BT corn hybrids so that the insects have a reduced chance of developing resistance to the protein. Chemical controls are really the weapon of last resort in an IPM program. There are many pesticides available for sale, each with unique characteristics. You need to consider your own pest management situation and select the best pesticide to use. Even when it is necessary to spray, you can still reduce the use of pesticides by using them wisely and only when and where they are necessary. Calibrate your sprayer. Wherever possible, use a border spray rather than spraying the whole field. The fifth step of IPM is evaluating the effectiveness of your program. This is the thinking part of your program. Keep detailed records of everything you do to manage pests. Review this information at the end of the growing season and make changes to your IPM program if required. Ask yourself, was the current pest management program effective? Did your monitoring methods provide you with the information you needed? Were you able to forecast pest problems? Did you record all the information you may need for defense against liability suits? IPM is complex because pests are able to change and adapt. You need accurate records of what you have done year by year in order to make smart management decisions when you modify your plan season by season. When it comes to pest management, remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Think about how you can prevent pest problems when you are making crop management decisions. Think about things like seed quality and varieties, health of the soil and plant nutrition. By using the five components of integrated pest management, identification, monitoring, thresholds, methods of control, and evaluation, pest control becomes a part of a total crop management system. IPM is a good business decision. It helps growers produce high-quality products economically with the lowest impact on the environment and human health. Being in the packing business and dealing directly with the chain stores, we find it very important to be in an IPM program. The consumer doesn't really want to hear about pesticides. They would prefer that you didn't spray any. They don't really understand the IPM program but they do understand that farmers are working hard to reduce the amount of pesticide use and we will continue to work hard to lower the levels of pesticide use because that's really what the consumer wants and they are the boss.